is also the visionary behind the 1990s so Saria, Sri Lanka's state-of-the-art ambulance service recognized by the World Bank in 2024 as one of the most technologically advanced and efficient in the world additionally he is a global as in her fellow ladies and gentlemen please put your hands together in welcoming Dr. Harsha De Silva Good evening, Iran, uh, you did a superb job making the introduction and I'll sort of take from where he left off because ours is a team, we work together, we think, we sit, we discuss, we debate and then Sajit will put a spanner in the works and then we discuss again and we arrive at some conclusion. Once we arrive at a conclusion, we will implement those. So first of all, ladies and gentlemen, I'm honored to be a part of this great team to launch an updated version of the SJB Blueprint. Our blueprint was first launched in 2022 when the crisis happened. We said, look, these are the things we think need to be done. Then in 2023, February, we launched the updated version of the blueprint 2.0. Subsequently, we worked on it for a year and now Hopefully, if you support us, we will form a government. And then what this updated blueprint talks about is that vision for our country. It's just not just a plan. It's a promise. A promise to rebuild Sri Lanka. A promise to chart a path towards resilience, innovation, and inclusive development. A promise to ensure that segments of society, all segments, benefit from our recovery and future growth. Our promise is based on our, on our ideology, what Iran touched upon, a social market economy. What is this? It's a synthesis of economic freedom that means we believe in markets and of economic justice we believe in inclusivity and equity that's really where Sajid plays a huge role he understands the suffering of the people he tells us always Harsha, Iran, Kabir all your theories are fine, but at the end of the day, we got to make sure the person, the man, woman, and the children in the household feel the change. So that's what we believe in. In other words, we want to create an economy that not only grows, but grows for everyone. When you read our blueprint, you will realize that we are not just about numbers and policies, but about people. It's about people. It's about empowering every Sri Lankan to contribute and benefit from development. Given the time I have, Sajit is on the way, I will break my presentation into four pillars, ten points. Governance, stabilization, growth, and equity. And I will conclude thereafter. 
the broad area of stabilization deals with managing the debt crisis, monetary and exchange rate policy, revenue consolidation, and expenditure consolidation. But before that, I'll start with the debt restructure because there's so much discussion on the debt restructure. And of course, the related agreement with the IMF. Maybe some of you know that Bondholders Steering Committee filed an amicus brief in the New York District Court last week to push the government to launch the restructure by the 15th of September. That just 10 days away. This goes to show the complexity of the transaction. A, we got the official creditor committee agreement reached, but not signed. It has a bunch of clawback clauses. B, the bondholders' proposal, we are told, the government has agreed to after negotiation. And that there is a 28% nominal haircut, but in 2028, when it really happens, depending on our progress measured in terms of US dollar GDP, the haircut could fall to, by all accounts, to 15%. Now the IMF has to agree that the two agreements are within the accepted debt sustainability analysis or the DSA. And furthermore, the OCC, that is the Official Credit Committee, must agree that the bondholders agreement is within the comparability of treatment. Thus far, multiple stay orders have been obtained in that district court. So uh, a decision on the case, a determination, could be held back until such time the government reaches agreement with the creditors. So these are friendly interventions to give the government time to agree. Now, these are all based on the DSA, which has been agreed between the government and the IMF, which then leads to the negotiations with the creditors. Now, some say this is outdated. This was agreed upon in 2022, but that's not really the case. Every time the staff level agreement is signed, you update it. But those updates thus far have not made any significant changes to the, the uh, parameters of debt to GDP, of the gross finance limits, the amount of foreign debt that we could go into year on year, and the gap that need to be closed by the restructure. So when yesterday I heard, or rather I read in the night, our competitor's economic plan, and in fact, the leader of the party spoke to many of you perhaps who would have been there yesterday, said, look, we can change the DSA because the Chamber of Commerce says that Sri Lanka's GDP growth 
might be 6.5% as opposed to 3.1% that the IMF has forecasted. Well, if the IMF is going to agree to the Ceylon Chamber of Commerce assessment that we will create 6.5% GDP, so be it. But let me tell you, that's not going to happen. So to mess around with the base document on which our entire program is structured on is a dangerous thing. And it's an irresponsible thing. What if during the course of the so-called renegotiation based on an alternate DSA, the Hamilton Reserve Bank verdict comes through? Then what will happen? Perhaps there are some bondholders here as well. And speaking to people who are representing the bondholders, White and Case and Rothschild, they think, why would others not also sue? Think about the danger of trying to create a different foundation for the restructuring that we are. Can you sort of, there's an echo. Can you reduce that echo, please? Restructure, that's continuing. Now let's, so I think we are very clear that when we say that there are certain limits within which we can negotiate this agreement with the IMF, there are limits within which we can negotiate and renegotiate with the creditors. It is not as if we can say, we will pay it when we can, and they will say, okay, no problem. That's not how the world works. Right? So let us be very, very careful in not being fooled by certain people who say that they can change the whole thing. Now let me get to the monetary and exchange rate policies. We are fully supportive of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka Act. They need independence. We did not oppose the Central Bank Act. And they will have the independence to manage inflation. That's their basic job. And we will agree, currently it's 5%, depending on what the environment is, it may be up or down. But once we agree, they will have to deliver. There is no room for politicians to interfere in setting interest rates. And let us be very clear, the moment you try to do that, what happens is, fiscal dominance of monetary policy. Like Iran said, somebody wants to set up some building somewhere, there is no money, you will tell the central bank, give me the money, print the money. Last time we did that, we learned a terrible, terrible lesson. And they are going to be accountable to parliament. Yesterday, some of you were there, and <laughs> Our political opponents flip-flopped on it. They said, yes, we support independence. But they said, Janavarama ilakka saksat karaganima sadaha mahabankwa kriyatmaka via yutui. Janavarama labena ilakka saksat karana mahabankwa kriyakaran onena. In the document it says, they proposed policy interest rates for economic growth, which is completely contradictory. On the one hand, you can't tell the central bank you manage inflation and you manage the currency. And on the other hand, you cannot say, well, this is the interest rate I want you to have so that I can encourage growth. So be mindful of what you hear and see whether these are actually practical, or some people are just 
saying things to please certain segments of society. On exchange rates, exchange rates must be market equilibrium. But to manage the volatility, there has to be some sort of intervention in the short term. The objective is to maintain an internationally competitive real exchange rate. A lot of people don't understand this. It is not the nominal exchange rate we need for international competitiveness. It is a real exchange rate. What it means is that the exchange rate will have to adjust for differences in price levels among either competitors or trading partners. So you can depreciate the interest rate, but if that depreciation is completely taken over by inflation, what happens is you're back to square one. So if you have an independent central bank, and if you are going to keep them to meet those targets, then we can have a low inflation regime and a stable uh, and a competitive exchange rate. Next area of focus in stabilization is revenue consolidation and expenditure control. On the revenue side, Iran mentioned earlier, the average revenue to GDP of emerging markets is 26%. Ours, he said, between 89 and 91 was the highest ever. And that was 23.3%. Then it declined. From 2004 to 2014, it declined to 11.2%. And with what Mangala did, late Mangala, uh, departed friend, we miss him all. We all miss him rather. Uh, brought it up to about 12.5%. But with what Gotabe Rajapaksa did, it fell back to 8.4. And that year, we were the lowest, absolutely the lowest revenue to GDP in the world. It's absolutely essential that we increase revenue. Now, people ask us, is 15.4% the agreement with the IMF? Is that feasible? We think it is feasible. By 2027 to 2029, we should meet 15.4% GDP uh, revenue to GDP. We are okay with that. But the issue is, how do we get it? Is it purely by increasing all kinds of taxes, or is it expanding the net and improving compliance? We are one of the worst in compliance. We should actually think about it ourselves, our own compliance. Do we comply? Right? So, the overarching plan to increase revenue and to increase compliance is digitalization. We will, as one of the first things we do, start implementing what we call the DPI, the Digital Public Infrastructure. Right? And that will be for transactions across the economy. Our plan is to establish, like Iran said, a unified revenue authority, incorporating the Inland Revenue Service, Customs and Excise. The IMF diagnostic study spells out the pervasive nature of corruption. It's embarrassing. They say at the highest levels, it's printed and distributed around the world that the IRS is corrupt, that the customs is corrupt, that excise is corrupt. So then, beyond digitalization, we have to make sure the rent-seeking behavior of those people has to be eliminated. Right? So unless you are able and willing to do that, unless you have the political will to implement that, corruption in these agencies will also continue. Now at the same time, those who pay are squeezed. I have a friend of mine who is a very big taxpayer. He pays every cent that he has to pay. He complains every Friday night. Harsha, what the hell? I pay so much. Can't you reduce my taxes? And I say, Majang, 
get your friends also to pay. It's really unfair. Pay guys have no escape. Right? A recent UNDP study this year shows that most people are not registered for taxes. Most people don't have TIN numbers. Yet they believe hey, you can't do that. And we say we can. We're not going to muck around with the targets that we have agreed upon. We will not change the tax-free threshold, but people have to pay some tax for their education, for their security, for their health. So we have devised a way beyond the first 100,000 tax-free limit up to about half a million rupees a month. The marginal tax rate will go from 1% to 24%. Beyond that, you will get back onto the existing marginal tax brackets going up to 36%. The corporate income tax for the moment will stay. But we think that we need to incentivize the tradable sector, the exporters. So whenever we can, and there is going to be debate about this because some people say profit is profit, so therefore everybody has to pay the same tax, but we think otherwise. And therefore, we will, the soonest possible, provide an incentive in corporate income tax for exporters. VAT will remain at 18. We would like to bring it down to 15 for selected items at least at the beginning and make it zero rated for certain essential items. For instance, even high protein food for infants today uh, get taxed at 18%. And if you understand the suffering of the people, you would wonder, is this the right thing to do? When 7 million people are in poverty, malnutrition is un un unbelievably high. Wasting, stunting. There are issues. So therefore, we will consider those. And for the ex exporters, I would like to uh, emphasize that SVAT will remain until such time there's a better way to deal with it. But we have to pay for all this. We can't give things free. So our thinking is the withholding tax will have to be relooked at. Now, withholding tax, people will say it's only a cash flow item. Sure, it's cash flow. But if compliance is so low, compliance is so low, we can collect 10% as opposed to 5% from those who are evading and those who are under-reporting. So therefore, we will have to seriously look at raising revenue through this measure. Then there is another issue with excise tax. Excise tax is actually ad valorem. So, sorry, specie tax. What we need to do is to index excise tax to some formula that reflects the taxes paid as prices increase. Then look at the casinos. The gross gaming revenue is only taxed at 15%. And there is online revenue in these casinos that gets taxed at zero. No tax. Nobody's paying. Is that fair? So we need to look at how to increase revenue from these measures. And I'm telling you as a chairman of the Committee on Public Finance, I have been at the government for the last one and a half years to set up a gambling regulator. Casinos are everywhere with no regulation. There's no way to actually find out what their profits are. You think we can really figure out what the profit of a casino is? Right? So there are e these issues that we'll have to deal with. We will also sign up with OECD, BEPS, Digital Economic Framework, and we're also thinking of uh, applying the minimum global alternate tax of 15% on multinationals. Because 
we have to find ways to pay for this. We're not going to just say we will do this, do that, and do the other thing unless we have revenue. Finally, in stabilization is expenditure control. We must rationalize public expenditure, and uh, we have to better target our uh, 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 spending. And in the future, if we form a government, all subsidies will be cash transfers. There is no need to give subsidies to everyone. But people who need subsidies will need to be targeted properly and transferred cash. But our blueprint also calls for revision of public sector salaries. Now, we were very responsible. We read the report of the expert committee appointed by the president, and the expert committee said, you have to increase public sector salaries by 24%, and also increase the cost of living allowance from 17,800 to 25,000. That's what we said. Now, the president went ahead and did it, and he went on a political stage and told us to remove those promises from our manifesto. We're not going to remove those from our manifesto. We've been very responsible. It's not some figure from the air we put. It is a number that was provided by the expert panel and approved by the Treasury. Then also there's going to be some other benefits, particularly on maternity leave benefits. It's not going to cost a whole lot of money. But you know that 80% of unemployed women are between the ages of 20 and 40. And there is enough evidence to suggest that we can uh, use this money for, 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 to improve the, 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 the labor force participation of women. Now on SOE reforms, I'm not going to go in there because Iran uh, talked about it. Next is the key pillar of growth, growth from stabilization. Yesterday, the JVP said in the economic policy document, 1977 was the beginning of the end. All regimes up to now destroyed the economy. Trend was exacerbated after 77 due to unplanned and unwise economic policies. Our view is quite the opposite. Many advances took place over the years. We are not a total basket case, thanks to early reforms. But those who opposed the reforms, those who brought in protectionist and interventionist policies, those who violently stopped this nation's progress, are the ones who destroyed our economy, in our view. Then since 2009, things got worse with severe interventions in markets, all kinds of import surcharges, politicized investment approvals, massive white elephant projects funded by domestic borrowing, money printing, etc. All this led to an anti-tradable bias in our economy, a bias against exports. Do you know exports fell from 30% in the early 2000s to just 15% now? Just look at this chart. The green line shows the Sri Lankan share in developing country exports in 19... 77, we had something like 0.03. Then it went up to about 0.3%, and it fell now 2%. When the developing country exports 50% to the world, we are falling. There's something wrong in our economy. And that is the serious issue that we need to resolve. We have hit the bottom. So there's massive upside if we have the right policies. Ea JVP kaatiya ki huwa, laksa tis sata ka daini ka velanda pola kuda nisa, in ehaate anna un thana pati kaarga la haraha jaatya antara velanda pola hoela denna angkela. But ours is not such marginal efforts of promises of non-events. We want to fundamentally reorient our economy to one that is globally connected with private enterprise driving growth. To do this, we need to do two things. 
One is trade and FDI liberalization. Two, unshackled domestic markets, including product and labor markets. What we must aim to do is to create productivity growth from our current low, or let me tell you, even negative productivity growth in the recent past. I will quickly list out some key policies that we plan to implement. On trade and FDI policy, replace quantitative restrictions with tariff and over time reduce towards a uniform low tariff regime. Give maximum backing for export-oriented FDI. We will see a new incentive structure that is rationalized for exporters based on the national export strategy, maximize the benefits of existing FTAs, utilize mutual recognition agreements, finally establish a national single window. Everyone is talking about a national single window. We have been trying to do this for years, but it is not getting done. Why? Not because we don't have the technology. It is because of certain people not wanting to let it happen. But when we embark on this path, it is critical. We implement trade adjustment packages to mitigate the negatives of some existing players. Because people will complain, look, we are losing out because you are opening out. So we can't do one without doing the other. We will certainly legislate anti-dumping regulations to protect our industries from unfair foreign competition. A key feature of our plan is to upgrade and expand industrial parks and EPZs. Like Iran said, if something good has happened, we will continue it. We have no problem with the new law that is going to let private enterprise create zones. In fact, our competitors have many, many more EPCs than us. Since 1978, Katunayaka, we have opened only 15 EPCs. But take, for example, in the Philippines, 92%, in Vietnam, 89%, and in India, 74% of export processing zones are private. But we have only one, that is MS Fabric Park. Sajit is really wanting to see whether you will help this country by setting up EPCs and factories, not just in one or two places in the country, but across the, across the island. Once we set the international trade and investment policy, then you can boost productivity, boost production of goods and services that your experts at. Again, yesterday I heard our competitors say, they will tell you how many five-star hotel rooms to build. They will tell you how many chefs to hire. That they will analyze the data and tell you where to invest. Also, Instead of two out of 50 entrepreneurs succeeding, they will ensure all 50 do. That is pie in the sky. No political politburo can do that. This is a failed model. No one is better able to tell you what to do than you yourself. You are successful because you know how to do it. I don't think we are going to fall for such stories. From the very people who stifled your ability to grow and until yesterday opposed reform. So our plan is to create a conducive platform tilted towards globally integrated agriculture, manufacturing and services. A few examples. We need to promote the creation of agriculture information platforms that allow transactions via the digital public infrastructure for farmers to know what buyers want to enter into forward sales agreements to banks to provide working capital on these forward sales agreements for insurance to be purchased but this is beyond the regular efforts of helping the farmer with his seeds fertilizer irrigation etc we need to promote the establishment of nationwide network of climate control agri warehouses this will be located in areas where farmers grow produce. Valley mother for potatoes, Martale for onions, Jaffna for chilies and so on. Do you know that we don't have a single, not one, not a single climate control warehouse for the millions of farmers out there? Right? 
And there are people who are agriculture ministers who are running for president. All these will be e-network facilities for dehydration, etc. We will provide incentives for net houses, for greenhouses, for drip irrigation and things like that. Our aim is twofold. One is to help farmers increase their incomes and two, within sort of two, to bring down cost of living. In industry, our focus is to facilitate our entrepreneurs to connect with the global value chains. Those who even oppose apparels are now attempting to erase the past. But we want to create an attractive environment for global manufacturing, be it in apparels, be it electronics, or advanced technology. Some specifics. Taxes are not what principally drives investment decisions. But given the competitive nature of FDI attraction, we will provide time-bound and specific incentives. We will already, we have already announced up to 300% advanced capital allowance. A key measure we wish to implement, this you might find a little odd, is to remove the minimum 30% value-added requirement for re-export. Now, why do I say that? Because the world is moving to fractional value addition, away from such obsolete practices. If, if we are to join global manufacturing value chains, we need to get volume. To think in the old paradigm, we leave us behind with those who advocate Politburo directives. We will set up dedicated India and China desks at the Economic Commission in, to incorporate us into their production networks. There is no time to talk about projected growth in the five southern states of India, but it would be unwise for us not to leverage this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. We will redouble our efforts to promote the Port City Special Economic Zone. Besides Homagama, Port City has the ability to become a regional technology center. Another key element is to promote R&D. We think the Slintech model is working, and we have already said 200% advanced capital allowance for R&D. We will push and exceed to the Madrid Protocol for IP rights to help innovation and global patenting. And finally, on services. Given the time, note that our focus will be on tourism, on logistics, on IT and e-commerce. We are fully aware of the requirement in the service sector, rather the globally connected service sector. Suffice it to say, we will walk our talk. Be it in agriculture, industry and services, it's not just the big guys. But it is the micro, small, and medium folk who need lots of support. I see some of them right here who have been fighting for the SMEs, MSMEs for so long. We have detailed in our blueprint document all what we are planning to do for MSMEs. From issuing, from the issue of the end of the end date on the Parate of 15th of December, to business revival units, to insolvency laws for MSMEs, etc., we will fix it. Beyond MSMEs is how we will fire the startup revolution. In our ideology, entrepreneurship is front and center. Our objective is to help our people create wealth as opposed to our competition who perhaps may tolerate some wealth. Our focus will be on talent, identification and building talent and on funding. I will not spend time now on public sector management, on energy and utilities reform, and factor market reform. Iran touched on it comprehensively. But just to say that our focus is on digitization and the elimination, like I said at the beginning, the rent-seeking behavior in the public sector. The proposed DPI, the digital public infrastructure, will be the foundation. We will roll out the DPI project in stages by digitally transforming the records at the register of persons and start implementation at the Welfare Benefits Board. Our policy on energy and utilities reform 
shall be based on efficient and transparent energy markets based on cost-based tariffs with major focus on renewable energy. Our factor market reform agenda is detailed in our blueprint. Our plan for capital markets is based on strengthening the domestic capital market. We dealt with it at length at the Capital Markets Forum. But to sum up, how we will leverage long-term funding from EPF and insurance pools to create a long-term domestic debt market for industry. This is beyond saying we will create another development bank. I also worked in a development bank. Iran ran a development bank. Just the word development bank means nothing. If you don't have access to long-term funding, you cannot give long-term loans. So you've got to really think about what you're saying when you say we set up a development bank. What you need is to link people who, people who have long-term uh, funding surplus with those with long-term funding deficits. Last, but the most important, or one of the most important issues is strong social safety nets. Like Iran said, poverty has increased from 3 million to 7 million. Only 5% of national income goes to the bottom 20%. One person sitting here enjoy 15% of national income, while the top 20% enjoy 51%. To maintain social stability that Iran talked about, to undertake social stability, to undertake reform, we must address this perennial issue. I'm going to stop. We have thought of three main items to focus on this. I will not go into details, but the first one is a new poverty alleviation program akin to Janasavia, where people are not just going to get doled out cash, but they will have to work for it. They will have to train for it. They will have to be able to find a job with the money that you get, so that within 24 months, you will have to have a plan to graduate from poverty. It's not going to be forever doling out money. And Sajid wants it to be woman-centered. Centered on the woman in the household, be it the mother, be it the wife, be it the daughter. Because we find out that they are more responsible than men, I'm sorry to say. But until such time, until such time, we will enhance the Aswasuma program because people need to survive. The second one will be uh, economic justice in subsidies. Like I said, we don't believe in everyone getting subsidies. Most of you here don't need to be subsidized uh, when you go to the petrol shed. But there are many others outside this hall who may need that. So therefore, targeted subsidies using the DPI to provide ne necessary subsidies for those who require. We will almost immediately upon taking office use the DPI for cash transfers, for fuel subsidies, for selected people. Finally, the third point is something that is critically important, is aging and associated pension reform. Old age dependency, that is share of elderly over the share of working people was 5% when we got independence. Today it is close to 20%. By 2050, it is going to be over 50 percent. And a lot of old people don't have a way of meeting ends meet. They can't pay for their health care. From my, so therefore, we will certainly consider reforms in that. So from, a, from what I explained, I hope it is clear to you, we have thought about the enormity of the problem we face and proposed to you a plan a promise to deal with the challenge facing us all. So to summarize, we will continue with the path of recovery, acknowledging the positives, yet change to ensure the recovery does not come at the expense of people's survival. We will incentivize tradable export growth into the long term, to permanently lift Sri Lanka out of the cycles of this crisis by generating high growth. We will undertake reforms to sustain the change we create and unshackle markets and use digitalization to its max to increase efficiencies and productivity 
across the economy. And at the end, what we will do is to bring on a win for all Sri Lankans. All this is easier said than done. The road will not be easy, but worth traveling. Together, we can turn this vision into reality. We can build a Sri Lanka that our children will be proud to inherit. Thank you very much.